Well, if you're spending $600, $1,000, $1,500 on a graphics card, you probably need a good monitor. How much do you need to spend on a monitor? We're covering monitors from about $250 to $2,000. So our next entry up, it's the Acer Predator CG7. This thing comes in a monstrous double-packed box. It comes with a remote, like a television, an RGB strips, and two DisplayPort cables, two 8K DisplayPort cables that we're gonna test with the level one KVM. This is a gaming monitor. It's VA, it's 144 hertz overclock. There's not enough bandwidth in DisplayPort 1.4 to be able to do 144 hertz. It's got USB-C, a built-in USB 3 hub, three more HDMI inputs, two DisplayPort inputs, and it's this monster, it's just insane. Let's take a look. It's a little bit TV, it's a little bit monitor. This is a uh, mature process VA panel. So you can't really compare IPS to VA to TN. Generally, those are different families of, of LCD panel. Generally, IPS panels are slower, TN panels are the fastest. VA sits somewhere in the middle, but depending on what generation it is, you're gonna have varied results. To give you an idea, a VA panels like the old school AMH, like the AMH399 and the, the AMH409, those old Korean monitors that uh, we reviewed a long time ago, those were like $300, $350, $400 at the time. Well, this thing's 2000. <laughs> what do you get to move the needle from $300 to $2,000? Well, first, there's the panel itself. It's been lovingly hand-tuned right out of the factory. 90% DCI P3 calibrated by a human being from the factory. Now, of course, we've got our color spider and we do our own calibration, so you can download our calibration um, from the, uh, the internet, but generally you should not do this because someone has already spent the time to calibrate your monitor if you bought this monitor. Color accuracy is about as good as it gets. It's not good enough for professional work, obviously. Uh, it's good enough though, if you're you know, a YouTuber, and just want to do some random stuff. 43 inches in 4K, it's one of my favorite resolutions. Also like 32 inches in 4K, I think that works really well. So I've got a couple of other 4K, 43 inch monitors in addition to this one. So gaming, how does it work with gaming? Can it, can it really push the frame rate? Is it is it really awesome? For my using it between, you know, 48 to 120 FPS, which is what you get out of the box, because again, 144 Hertz is an overclock and we'll talk about that. Uh, it's buttery smooth, especially using the 3090. Uh, the 3090 can push a little higher frame rate in more titles than the 6800 XT right now. But if you set your graphics to like medium and medium high, the 6800 XT and the 3090 are really close in terms of real world performance. I spent the most time in Borderlands 3 and it was really hard for me to tell a difference in Borderlands 3, especially if I wasn't running it ultra. If I was running it like, you know, high, just one step down from ultra, both graphics cards had a really amazing experience. The G-Sync implementation here is NVIDIA certified. It's not the FPGA G-Sync implementation. It is the Visa variable refresh rate implementation. So of course it is FreeSync compatible. The lower end of that FreeSync range though, 48 FPS. So you're gonna need a ridiculous graphics card to be able to push the full, you know, potentially 48 Hertz to 144 Hertz. As it stands, I ran it from 48 Hertz to 120 Hertz because I was pushing it through the level one KVM. I've got my desk set up here and boy, this monitor is picky about cables. The cables that it comes with, A minus, not bad. Because remember, you know, some of the other monitors that I reviewed, the cables that it comes with, they get like an F or a D minus. These are 8K cables, they're labeled 8K. They don't feel particularly high quality, but they do the job. And they actually worked with the level one KVM as long as I was using a short three foot, really high quality cable from the KVM to the uh, display. But what's a KVM? It's basically a monitor switch box, except the ones that level one makes are extra fancy because they can handle 4K and 120 Hertz. They can even handle display stream compression. But uh, this monitor refers to it as an overclock and I'm gonna save that for uh, <laughs> another video sort of on down the road. So in the on-screen menus, out of the box, it comes in a DisplayPort 1.4 mode with a nominal mode for the overdriver and uh, some other settings in the on-screen display that mean that you're only gonna get 120 hertz out of the box. That is a major kind of annoyance because it goes from 60 to 120 hertz. I would have liked to have seen like 75 and 90 hertz or 75 and 100 hertz, something like that other than 120 hertz for various technical reasons, but 
you really should have more refresh rate options. If you manually create a refresh rate, I created one for 100 hertz, it worked. And that shouldn't surprise me because of the whole FreeSync thing, but I would like to have that built into the monitor options. Now, while we're on the topic of refresh rates and input latency and all this other kind of stuff, I was kind of surprised to learn that the input delay on this monitor on the HDMI ports is about 10 milliseconds. If you turn the overdriver on in the on-screen display, you can get it down to about 8 milliseconds. However, if you run on the DisplayPort ports using the level 1 HDMI to DisplayPort, see what I did there? DisplayPort 1 and DisplayPort 2 will run at about 6.8 milliseconds. But that's still kind of high. I mean, some much less expensive monitors are able to run in the 2 millisecond range. If you're a pro gamer, you might care about that. But I think this latency range is perfectly acceptable. Bear in mind that a lot of TVs operate in the like 40 to 100 milliseconds input latency. Um, it's probably doing that in order to be able to overdrive the VA panel properly because, you know, normally VA, it does not operate in a 120 hertz refresh capacity. Speaking of which, let's verify those claims. What we do here is basically the UFO test. We look at chase squares and we look at high speed footage. We vary the shutter speed on the camera from 240 to 1 240th of a second to 1 400th of a second. And we can see here that the uh, number of squares on the screen at any given time is a maximum of two squares. That means the response time on this panel is pretty good. It does sort of shift to the blue end of the spectrum when it's coming on. We'd also do a scroll test where we scroll different things. You know, black text on a white screen, you can look at it and see if there's any smearing or anything like that. To my eye, it looked really, really sharp. In the close-up footage, it was maybe not as sharp as it looked in person. I'm not sure if that's display artifacts or something else really weird going on. Um, the worst case scenario is scro scrolling gray, uh, like a gray zebra pattern on black. And you can really see that uh, some of the electronics in the display is, you know, sort of overcompensating for trying to scroll a zebra. So, you know, there's, there's almost a hundred milliseconds of uh, the display catching up from going, from displaying black to gray. Is it, you know, maybe true that I expect better of a $2,000 monitor? Yeah, maybe. I mean, the only thing that's really head and shoulders far and away better than any other display technology is something like OLED, possibly quantum dot display, but um, I need a little bit more mileage with those type of displays in order to figure this out. In terms of a panel layout, I'm pretty sure this is a BGR panel. It's actually kind of hard to tell. You have to look at it sort of straight on and being a 43 inch display, you know, it's pretty tricky. Now it does have all of the other um, sort of downsides that a VA panel has. First, if you're at an extreme viewing angle, you can see this weird shadowing in the corner. And that's because the panel itself is th so thick, you're actually seeing past the edge of the display, like into the case of the monitor, or not really, just into the edge of the, the casing that's actually holding the display, you know, like the, the metal frame or the reflective frame or something like that. So uh, when you're straight on and when you're at least, you know, a foot and a half away from the monitor, it is actually pretty good. It's just the type of thing for this panel. In terms of text sharpness, running this at 100% display scaling in Windows, which is what I like to do, so can take advantage of the full 4K real estate, text is very sharp. Definitely sharper than other 43 inch monitors that I've reviewed in this class, which is nice to see that the electronics in the panel is not doing anything uh, unacceptable or weird or overly complicated to try to, you know, squeeze more out of the panel than it was really designed to and as a result muddles the text. We've definitely seen that on other 43 inch 4K displays. This display uh, doesn't do that. It's nice and clear and sharp. Even though it's a BGR panel layout, you don't have to do any shenanigans in order to get it to work. Nice job Acer. Now this monitor is extremely heavy and it was a, it was a real trick to get it you know wedged in here. Not really but you know it's a 100 by 200 millimeter visa mount, so you can mount it on an arm or something like that, but you're gonna need a specialized mount, probably something more like a TV mount, if I were, say, going to mount this to the wall over here, which is admittedly pretty tempting. It comes with a really sturdy, you know, metal foot. You can actually put uh, controllers or something like that. This monitor is kind of designed to have your video game consoles and your computer all plugged into it in like a dorm room or a bedroom type scenario so that you just have one display for your TV and your computer and all of your consoles. And I guess that's a, that's an okay use case, but you know, uh, if you're also a geriatric gamer and have trouble seeing things anymore, well, the giant display and the large text, that'd probably work out real well for you. Also, oddly in the box, or maybe on purpose, I don't know, it came with uh, four RGB LED strips. Now it comes with all of the cables and everything, and there's actually four outputs on the monitor. These are digital RGB LED strips. You can program the LED strips to go along with your music or to respond to things in your game. You can get ambient environmental lighting. 
I, you know, okay, that's cool. That I don't. I, I shudder to think how much of that price tag uh, was that. I mean, this monitor actually came out about a year ago, and it was about two thousand dollars. I got it on sale for fifteen hundred, so your mileage may vary. Uh, but still, I shudder to think how much of the price is the RGB strips. It's like, I don't need that. I need Acer. You need you need to make this exact same monitor that has like one or two display inputs. No USB-C, which is nice. It's a nice touch that it's USB-C. Uh, no, uh, you know, USB, no speakers. The speakers in this are worthless anyway. It's got two 10-watt speakers. Just don't even... I'm telling you that the box says it has speakers, but don't even worry about it. It doesn't really have speakers. Just pretend that it doesn't have speakers and you won't be disappointed. Uh, basically, just the panel. Give me the panel in a box, and let me just plug in DisplayPort and maybe HDMI. Two inputs and save as much money off the price as possible. That's what Acer should do, because the panel itself is great. Tech sharpness is great. The gaming experience is, is great. Don't know if it's $2,000 great. Certainly not $2,000 great, because I didn't buy it for $2,000, but $1,500 was just tempting enough. And also the NVIDIA certified G-Sync, that was enough to sort of send me over the top, because this is the only G-Sync monitor that I actually own. Uh, level one might have also needed some tax write-offs, but it's fine. Our test system here is the uh, MSI EK Carbon X. This is a really awesome Z490 motherboard with the uh, 10900K. No, nobody's paying me to say that or anything like that. It's just really fast, 5.3 gigahertz, built-in water cooling with the full EK cooling kit with a 360 millimeter radiator and our uh, fractal case here with the with all the RGB and the tempered glass. But uh, I've been swapping out GPUs. So right now it's got a Radeon 6800. Yeah, it's got the 6800 in here. I've also had the 6800 XT and the 3090. Now I think the 3080 and the 6800 XT would be what I would recommend kind of as the minimum GPU for this display if you're going to want to run the 4K. The 3070 and the 6800 just don't have quite enough oomph. Uh, if you turn on rage mode and do a little bit of overclocking on the 6800 XT and you turn on smart access memory. Um, the 6800 XT is pretty reasonable at 4K in most titles at like medium high settings. The 3090 does a little bit better in some titles but some AMD titles the 6800 XT can push over 60 FPS no problem. Uh, and most titles that I tested uh, rarely if ever go below 48 fps at those medium high graphic settings with either the 6800 xt or the 30 the 30 uh 3080 so you know your mileage may vary depending on what your goals are um for the gaming end of things and like i say if you're into productivity it's big enough for productivity and the text sharpness is good enough that you can uh, you know work and play from home overall the verdict is i'm pretty impressed with the monitor i think there there are better deals to be had in the monitor space the biggest con here is that it's still kind of expensive. That said, Acer is being kind of innovative here in terms of like what they're offering for display and some of the bundles. I don't want to discourage them too much, but $2,000 is certainly, I don't think, the right price. Uh, I really think that the, the whole display industry is kind of ripe for innovation uh, or ripe for some kind of disruptive innovation because we need, like OLED is great, but you know it burns in and has some other problems. We need all of the characteristics of OLED without... Um, sort of the mechanical downside of OLED and panel technology is getting really close. IPS technology, like the speed of IPS is catching up. It's still not nearly as fast as this VA panel, but IPS doesn't suffer from things like, you know, the edge thing. IPS has a different set of problems. So I really think that we need some sort of fundamentally new and different technology. It's on my shopping list to try one of like the quantum dot things, but Samsung seems to be more focused on the uh, television side of things than the computer display side of things. So if there are any other displays that you guys know of that cost less than say two grand, that would be good for level one to get in. Let me know. But I'm definitely looking for some new models. I'm hoping, you know, I know it's like, you know, the year of insanity and like everything is, is not great. But if there are new models of displays coming out, um, I think that'll be exciting because everybody's working from home and needs to play and do stuff. All right. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, this has been a review of the Predator CG7, or the longer version of the name, the CG437K. Yeah, I'm glad that Acer decided to call it, let's call it the CG7 for short. Yeah, that's much better than CG437K, that's just, ugh. I don't know, it's been fun. I like having this on my workbench though. And I got my KVM set up so I can switch between four computers. Woo! Alright, I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.